Good morning, everybody. I trust you are all well. Good. I'm glad to hear it. This morning's Mass is for Frank and Anne Carr. So, on this first Sunday of July, the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time, we begin as we always do, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now let us pause and prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries by calling to mind our sins. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart, Lord have mercy. You came to call sinners, Christ have mercy. You were seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us, Lord have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who in the abasement of your Son have raised up a fallen world, fill your faithful with holy joy, for on those you have rescued from slavery to sin you bestow eternal gladness. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The first reading is from the book of Zechariah. The Lord says this, Rejoice, heart and soul, daughter of Zion. Shout with gladness, daughter of Jerusalem. See now, your king comes to you. He is victorious. He is triumphant, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will banish chariots from Ephraim and horses from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be banished. He will proclaim peace for the nations. His empire shall stretch from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will bless your name forever, O God, my King. I will give you glory, O God, my King. I will bless your name forever. I will bless you day after day and praise your name forever. I will bless your name forever, O God, my King. The Lord is kind and full of compassion, slow to anger, abounding in love. How good is the Lord to all, compassionate to all his creatures. I will bless your name forever, O God, my King. All your creatures shall thank you, O Lord, and your friends shall repeat their blessing. They shall speak of the glory of your reign and declare your might, O God. I will bless your name forever, O God, my King. The Lord is faithful in all his words and loving in all his deeds. The Lord supports all who fall and raises all who are bowed down. I will bless your name forever, O God, my King.
from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Your interests are not in the unspiritual, but in the spiritual, since the Spirit of God has made his home in you. In fact, unless you possess the Spirit of Christ, you would not belong to him. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your own mortal bodies through his Spirit living in you. So then, my brothers, there is no necessity for us to obey our unspiritual selves or to live unspiritual lives. If you do live in that way, you are doomed to die. But if by the Spirit you put an end to the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus exclaimed, I bless you, Father, Lord of heaven and of earth, for hiding these things from the learned and the clever and revealing them to mere children. Yes, Father, for that is what it pleased you to do. Everything has been entrusted to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, just as no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Shoulder my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Yes, my yoke is easy, and my burden light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Jesus Christ. Are you ready for a story? Good. One day, little Johnny came up to his father and asked, Dad, where did I come from? Well, Dad squirmed a bit, but thought it was about time his son knew the facts of life. So, Dad told his son how the expression of love resulted in the beginning of life, then how life developed in the womb, and finally, how a child was born. As Dad told the story, his son's eyes got wider and wider. When Dad was finished, his son said, Wow, that's really cool. That certainly beats what Billy told me. He said he came from Manchester. <laughs> well, with that as an introduction, now let me tell you where I come from. I'm from the metropolis of Wombwell. And as anyone knows, Wombwell is the cultural centre of the civilised world, or so we like to think. <laughs> Have any one of you been to Wombwell at all? Have you even managed to find it on the map? Well, it's in Yorkshire, God's county, where every blade of grass is blessed. Actually, Wombwell couldn't have been a better place to grow up in. Our little bungalow at the bottom of Wilson Street is still there, and that's where I live today. I have a younger brother, and growing up, we attended the local schools. This was in the days before all the land surrounding us was covered with council houses, and you could actually tell where one town ended and another began. In those days, Wilson Street dead-ended in a ploughed field. My brother David and I were members of the Wilson Street Gang, and our arch rivals were the Mitchells Lane Gang. They lived next to a huge colliery because this was a coal mining town. 
but on Sundays and holy days we observed a truce when we all went to the local parish church. There we belted out the hymns, not always in tune, but certainly with great enthusiasm. <laughs> now, for you younger members watching today, <clears throat> let me try to describe what it was like growing up in Womwell. We didn't have television in those days. Instead, we listened to the wireless, powered by something we called accumulators. We read Dandy and Beano comics. We drank Tizer and also Dandelion and Burdock. The streets were lit by gas and a fellow came round every evening to light them with a long stick. Everybody would set their clocks to Mitchell Lane's pit whistle at shift change. And in those days, crossing the main road was considered hazardous. No, not from any passing vehicle but from stepping into the exhaust left behind horses. <laughs> we never locked our house door. We knew and always respected the local Bobby on the beat. And spaceships and trips to the moon were things we read about in books by Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. The years during and immediately after the war were hard for us. There was rationing, so we ate lots of turnips, bread and dripping sandwiches, and when we were lucky we had tripe and black pudding. There were plenty of buses and the trains were powered by steam, but always on time. There were no Tesco's, Asda's or Morrison's, or any supermarkets for that matter. We shopped at the local co-op, where the fellow behind the counter calculated the bill for our groceries in his head. We used pounds, shillings and pence, and we measured temperature on the Fahrenheit scale. How many of you can remember those days? Anybody old enough? Should I tell you that my great-grandnephews think I am older than dirt and had a dinosaur for a pet? Anyway, that was the tradition I grew up in. And I tell you all this because I'm grateful that I was able to grow up in a protected environment such as Womwell, where I was able to learn truths and values that have carried me through life. Like Paul put it in the second reading today, our interests in those days were on the spiritual. Now, some of you may be thinking that the kids these days need to have their horizons broadened in order to help them grow up. Perhaps you are among those who think children should be sexually active and that boys can be girls and girls can be boys in primary schools. Nonsense. Nonsense. Now, listen again to what Paul said. If you do live in that way, you are doomed to die. But if by the Spirit you put an end to the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So protect your children while you can. Reinforce their spiritual understanding. Teach them the truths and values of Christ. Give your children the tools to deal with the rampant evil in this world. All too soon, the time will come when those values will be challenged by the false values of the world. And let no one be in any doubt. The values of Christ are very much under attack today. The learned and the clever of our British society have rejected God and God's ways in favor of a new secular and relativistic state a state where the traditional family unit is being destroyed and traditional values are being replaced by false values that, that says you can do anything you want in the name of personal pleasure and expediency. When you come to think about it, we have become the kind of society that civilized countries used to send their missionaries to. And that's exactly what I was a missionary priest in a place called Kentucky. And it was in America 
that I was converted to Catholicism and became a priest. Does it surprise you that America has mission territory? Where I served in the Diocese of Lexington in Kentucky, Catholics comprised less than 2% of the entire population. In most of that diocese, Catholics are less than half a percent of the local population. The Diocese of Lexington is 64 parishes and missions scattered over 16,423 square miles and in 50 counties of eastern Kentucky, the part known as Appalachia. Now let me tell you about some of my experiences while serving as the parish priest in just one of those counties where I took care of two parish churches and a school. The county in question is located in southeastern Kentucky and right on the border with Virginia and Tennessee. By the way, that's where the famous Cumberland Gap is located for those of you old enough to remember the Lonnie Donegan song. Does anyone remember that song? Well, if you do, put it in the comments below. Now, not too many years ago, the community was one of those close-knit, self-contained, all-American small towns, sheltered to an extent from the corrosive winds of modernity by the mountains and forests that surrounded it. But greed made its way into the mainstream. It has been strip-developed, subdivided, fast-fooded, asded and Tesco'd into a conventional suburban middle-class town with only a faint fading identity. It could be any place in America or even in England, except for some rather unusual characteristics. First, it's a dry county. Now, no, I do not mean dry as in a desert. I mean dry as in no pubs. Oh. Now, that's due to the influence of local fundamentalists, Free Will Baptists mainly, who about a hundred years ago thought they could legislate drinking habits. It didn't work. In fact, what it did do was promote a very lucrative bootlegging industry. Then, as now, all holy water in the area is distilled through three Cadillac radiators. <laughs> That's right, moonshine. <laughs> A second characteristic is the practice of slavery. Now, yes, I know that slavery is supposed to have been abolished in America, but here I'm referring to the practice of buying and selling babies. You see, there are an incredible number of teen pregnancies in the county. 46% of schoolgirls aged no more than 13 or 14 are pregnant or are mothers already. Instead of emphasizing abstinence and chastity, which in America is seen as a religious thing and thus to be avoided, the state schools teach safe sex and hand out contraceptives. Sounds a lot like England these days, doesn't it? And just like here, the kids in Kentucky see that as having official permission to engage in sexual activity, which has led to increased promiscuity and yet even more pregnancies. But now those kids have discovered there is a lot of money to be made by selling their unwanted babies to childless couples. Some say it is a kindness, which I suppose from one perspective it is, but it is still slavery and it is still wrong. You see, for years, the traditional teenage pastime was hanging out, but the kids to their harm have now been placed on the first pillar of a consumerist society, materialism. Its youngsters are heirs now to the same pressures and anxieties that bedevil those in similar communities from 
California to Florida, and now from John O'Groats to Land's End in the UK. They use drugs and alcohol and drive around at all hours with their car radios loud enough to wither the roadside flowers. The culture has changed, so the kids of today experiment with New Age philosophies, drugs, sex, violence, and even dabble in the occult, devil worship. Well, just where do you think all the rioting, violence, and looting has been coming from that we've been reading about on the, in the newspapers? But there's a third characteristic, a high illiteracy rate. Illiteracy has always been high in Appalachia, but in that part of Kentucky, it's embarrassingly high among the young. The reason is sport. Sport has become more important in the culture than academics. The media presents sports stars as pampered gods and paints academically inclined scholars as clumsy nerds, geeks, or dorks. I think I've got those words right. Besides, excelling in sport gets favorable attention from their parents. Good report cards do not. And what part does religion take in this area? Well, as I said, fundamentalists comprise the main group. The key characteristic is Bible pounding with an almost exclusive preaching on the end times as read in the book of Revelation, the book of the apocalypse. The other characteristic is seen in their hatred and intolerance for other religions, particularly for Catholics. It should not come as a surprise to you to learn that the Ku Klux Klan is very active in the area and still meets regularly every week. Their particular brand of hatred is evidenced by ominous white hooded marchers, the occasional murder by person or persons unknown, as they say, and, in my case, with burning crosses on the presbytery lawn, death threats and bullet holes in the windows of my car. Religious intolerance also includes shooting out the stained glass windows in the parish church for sport, as well as general vandalism. When I first arrived as their new parish priest, I was met by the news that the church had been broken into and that there had been a black mass, Satan worship. The tabernacle had been forcibly opened and the hosts scattered all over the sanctuary floor. Symbols of the occult were spray-painted on the altar. It was a sharp reminder that evil is real and that Satan is alive and well and living on planet Earth. Besides the occult, Appalachia is also famous for its holiness churches. There was one just around the parish church there, around the corner. Now, in case you're interested in attending one of their worships, I should warn you that snake handling is a regular feature. They actually pass live rattlesnakes around the congregation to see if they can live up to the verse that's found only in the Gospel of Mark. They will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. <laughs> Anybody care to nip out to the local zoo and pet a rattlesnake to see if your faith is up to scratch? Anybody? <laughs> of course, people have died from poisonous snake bites. And even though the practice is illegal, nothing is ever done about it. Other than sending around another ambulance. Now, whoever said being a priest was dull and boring hasn't talked to me. And yet, in the middle of all this, the church stands as a spiritual beacon offering a different way, a different lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that may well be hidden from the learned and the clever, people who want to force their own agendas upon us, 
But for those who are prepared to trust Jesus and accept his way, it's a lifestyle that will bring them peace and rest. All one has to do is accept it. Secularism may still be dominant in the world, but the church has neither caved in nor surrendered to it. But through her works of goodness and charity has revealed God's power and love to all who seek a better way. So progress has been made. We now have schools where children can learn solid Christian values in a safe environment. We have outreach ministries that provide pregnancy counseling and offer legal adoption services as well as an alternative to abortion or slavery. The church is very active in providing programs that meet the basic needs for food, shelter and clothing. We even provide nursing and medical care to remote families in the hollers, as they are called. In other words, we have tried to follow Jesus' instructions when he summoned the twelve and sent them out to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils. In my lifetime, I've trekked across deserts and forded raging torrents. I've climbed high mountains and traversed deep gorges. I have chopped my way through tropical jungles and snowshoed across Arctic tundra. I've flown higher than the eagles and dived to the bottom of the sea. Jesus' promise about an easy yoke and a light burden was hard to accept in the beginning, but I've learned to trust him, and now I have no regrets. Bullets, rattlesnakes, and burning crosses notwithstanding. <laughs> A few years ago, my health was shown to be somewhat less than it should be. So my bishop decided to put me on my bike and retire me. So here I am, back home in Yorkshire, full circle. But God's work in Appalachia, or even here in this part of England, isn't finished yet. There's still much left to do. So now it's your turn to show how much you have learned from Jesus. Well, someone has to protect the lives of the unborn and tell the learned and clever politicians that all human life is sacred. Someone has to speak out for the poor, the abused and the exploited. Someone has to stand up and defend the teaching of the church against those who seek to destroy it. Someone has to protect our children and show them how to live by Christian morals and values. Someone has to expose hypocrisy and blow the whistle on dishonest deals. Someone has to tell the sinner that they are loved by God and that the only path to wholeness is through sincere repentance. Someone has to carry the light of Christ to the many good people who still live in darkness. So now it's your turn to take up the yoke. It's been said that the really important thing for any church is not how many it seats, but how many it sends. That reminds me about a father who overheard his two sons playing church. One of the boys was explaining to the other what all the parts of the liturgy were about. Do you know what it means at the end of Mass when the priest does this, he asked, making the sign of the cross? No, he asked, making, uh, what does it mean? It means some of you go out this way and some of you go out that way. <laughs> You know, there's a whole world out there waiting to hear the good news about Jesus. As Jesus taught and sent his disciples out, so now he sends you. Some of you go out that way and some of you go out that way. <laughs> and that's the way it is. God bless you.
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us thank our Saviour who came into this world that God might be with each one of us. Father, we pray for Francis our Pope and Ralph our Bishop. Guide them and bless them in their work. Lord, hear us. Lord, help us on this day of rest to seek goodness in all your creatures. Open our eyes and our hearts to your love in the world. Lord, hear us. Lord, we meet around your table as your family. Help us to see that our bitterness is forgotten, our discord is resolved, and our sins are forgiven. Lord, hear us. We pray for all Christian families. May your spirit deepen their unity in faith and love. Lord, hear us. Father, help the sick to share their sufferings with Christ. May they know in him the fullness of life and love. Lord, hear us. Father, have mercy on those who have died in the peace of Christ. Receive them into the home you have prepared for them. Lord, hear us. Now let us pause and add our own needs and prayers, and of those of the entire church. Lord, hear us. Mary trusted in God her Saviour, so now we have the courage to say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Go forever. And by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. With humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord, and may our sacrifice of your saints be pleasing to you, Lord God. 
Wash me away from my iniquities, cleanse me from my sin. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. May this oblation dedicated to your name purify us, O Lord, and day by day bring our conduct closer to the life of heaven, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis our Pope, Ralph our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours 
forever and ever. And now at the Saviour's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign for ever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Now let us offer each other the sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. 
Grant, we pray, O Lord, that having been replenished by such great gifts, we may gain the prize of salvation and never cease to praise you through Christ our Lord. There is only one announcement to share with you this morning. Now that the churches are being opened again and masses will be held in the local parishes, I will no longer be giving a mass over the internet. That's to encourage people to go to church now that the doors are opening again. And that is good news indeed. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.